my uh, professional focus as a research scientist is to study metabolic disorders in a kind of big sense, but to narrow it down a little more, I'm interested in how the hormone insulin plays into disease. We know it's essential, uh, but too much of it starts to really hurt the body. And, and that uh, gives rise to a condition called insulin resistance. And that is happens to be the most common um, disorder in the world. Uh, and it's relevant because it plays into virtually every other chronic disease. Wow, okay. Um, that's crazy. Um... Hello my darlings and welcome back to my channel. My name is Despina or you can just call me Desi for short. And hello, I have been absent for about a week and a half because I have been dying at university, literally dying. I've had my, I feel that like my brain cells don't work any, anymore because I have been reading that many books and that many, I don't know what I, I've been reading. I've, I've just been absorbing these big amounts of information but I'm back, don't worry. And as you can see, I'm quite tan. I've been out in the sun quite a bit. Um, and yeah, I've been super duper busy, but in today's video, um, for those of you who are new, this channel is all about leveling up your lifestyle and just improving every single aspect of your life. Um, in today's video, I'm quite excited as usually am, but I have interviewed a very interesting professor. He is a professor of insulin resistance. Now, if you don't know what insulin resistance is, that's pretty much where your body cannot break down insulin and therefore it can't be used properly and therefore you put on weight a lot quicker. Now, I had insulin resistance for a while. I know quite a few people that have it and it's quite common. My podcast is out on Spotify, so don't forget that. I will link that down below. It's the Despina Cup podcast and I'm so proud of it. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to Professor and Dr. Benjamin Bigman. Let's go. Good. <laughs> All right, Ben. Um, can you tell us a bit about yourself and what you do for those that don't know you? Yes, and, and many wouldn't. No. <laughs> uh, I am a research uh, scientist and a professor at Brigham Young University in the U.S., and my my teaching is a class called pathophysiology. That's what I teach my undergraduates, which is essentially me making sure they understand the processes yep. of the sick body when things um, go wrong. Okay. Um, I want to get into that a bit further on. Now you've written quite a few books. Can you tell us about those books? I know I've got one that's coming in the mail. It's called Why We Get Sick. But can yeah. you tell me about the other books too? Well, so there might be some misunderstanding. I've only written one book, oh, but I've written, okay, but I've written many, oh, no problem, but I've written many peer-reviewed publications or manuscripts, oh. which is sort of the language of science. You know, you make a discovery and then you uh, make it, you turn it into a peer-reviewed publication. Mm -hmm. So I have multiple, I have many um, scientific manuscripts published, but only the one book. Um, but the book really represents the <clears throat> crystallization or, or the distilling of everything I've been learning and studying for years as a scientist. And so the book kind of takes insulin resistance and packages it into mm -hmm something that is easy to read that really gives the reader an understanding of what is insulin resistance, why does it matter, where does it come from, and what to do about it. So that's essentially the pillars of the book. But all of the body of literature that I've produced falls within the realm of metabolic function, how the body uses energy, mm -hmm. how it uses fats or glucose, what, yeah. how it uses ketones, and, and that theme of biomedical work. Okay, that sounds rather complicated. Um, how long have you been in this industry for? Would you call it an industry? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can call it an industry. Mm. Um, yeah, so I have been, I would say that I've been in this field since my PhD. So that is okay. about, um, that's been about 15 years. Okay, that's a while. All right. Actually, a little longer. <laughs> yeah, frankly. right. Um, now, I am quite familiar in my opinion of insulin resistance i have uh picos and that runs mm -hmm. in my family genes now we did a dna test while i was in the usa and we are predisposition to insulin resistance now this is why i came across you um i interviewed 
um, Dr. Sean Baker, who I'm pretty sure you're familiar with, and he told me to talk to you. Now, um, can you tell us what exactly is insulin resistance and why is it so dangerous to a human being? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Sean is a friend and even contributed a little blurb um, to the book. Uh, So insulin resistance is really two problems wrapped up into one. Um, It is, and we need to understand this to understand how it relates to so many other diseases like PCOS or PCOS. Mm -hmm. So insulin resistance is really a, it's a coin with two sides. I think it's best described. So we're call I'm holding the coin and I'm calling the coin insulin resistance. One of the sides is in fact insulin resistance where the hormone insulin isn't working as well as it used to at Mm -hmm. some cells of the body. So some cells are resistant to insulin. The other side of the coin, which it's always there, there are always two sides to the coin. You can't have the coin without both sides. And that is that blood levels of insulin are elevated. And that is actually the part. So again, insulin isn't working very well at some cells other cells it's working perfectly fine and blood levels of insulin are chronically higher than they should be or than they would ideally be and it's that latter part it's the other side of the coin that is relevant in the situation of polycystic ovary syndrome because the hormone insulin is inhibiting the ovaries ability to turn testosterone into estrogens so it's a little known fact that all estrogens were once testosterone. And then the gonads, whether it's the ovaries in the woman or the testes in the man, of course, the ovaries do it much, much more. It converts testosterone into estrogens. There's an enzyme that does that. Insulin stops that from happening. And so if a woman has really uh, has higher than normal insulin levels, or I should say higher than is ideal for her body, then it's preventing the ovaries from taking a big chunk of testosterone and turning it into a really big chunk of estrogens. And so what happens relatively with the higher insulin is that less of the estrogens are being produced. And in the absence of a big estrogen production, she she is unable to have a normal ovulatory cycle. And that really is the basis of PCOS, which is why um, more and more people refer to PCOS as metabolic infertility, because at its core, we, uh, by calling it polycystic ovary syndrome, it just leaves the person with this impression that, oh, I just have ovaries that have lots of cysts, because that's the name of the disease. But that doesn't tell you what the origin of the problem is, when in reality, the origin of the problem is too much insulin. And what's so interesting about that connection, and I don't mean to harp on PCOS, you just brought it up and it's such a common problem, is is that even in women who don't fit the profile of insulin resistance, they still have detectable insulin resistance. So typically we think of insulin resistance as someone who just looks like they're metabolically unhealthy. But in reality, we know that in even in young women who are healthy by any metric, uh, and you can take women with PCOS, women without PCOS, and compare uh, identical like body. They're the same kind of body size and body weight. The women with PCOS will still have a higher level of insulin resistance than the women without PCOS. So even when it doesn't appear to be obviously related, it still has a hand in in the disease. And the same goes, I'm talking about PCOS, but we could go Mm -hmm. over to the most common form of infertility in men, which is erectile dysfunction. There are scientists who believe that insulin resistance um, manifests in its earliest form in some men as erectile dysfunction, that that's the earliest sign. And that's through totally different totally different mechanisms. And in that case, it's because the blood vessels themselves become insulin resistant and now they can't dilate. And if blood vessels can't dilate very well, well, now a man has erectile dysfunction. So the two most common forms of infertility in men and women, erectile dysfunction and PCOS respectively, both have a common core, which is insulin resistance. That's insane. I never knew that. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, would you classify insulin resistance as an epidemic? And why would you call it that? Yeah, yeah, an epidemic um, insofar as it is everywhere and it is a problem. <clears throat> so in that sense, it kind of fits the description. And 
uh, it, it is the most common disorder in the world, um, which, which is shocking. People, people sort of balk or they're taken back when I say that, and maybe they're a little skeptical, but, but it really, uh, in the U.S., um, it affects, there, there is the chance that, you know, we haven't confirmed this in the population, but up to potentially 88% of U.S. adults may have insulin resistance. And it's easy to kind of point, point the finger at the U.S. You know, we, we're, we, we are the butt of our own jokes that we're so, you know, overweight and unhealthy. But the, the reality is that on the spectrum of insulin resistance, there are countries that are actually worse than the U.S. Almost all of the Middle East is Oman, Egypt, the United Arab Emirates have higher rates of type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance than the U.S. Mm. Mexico, Mexico has higher rates. Um, Singapore in Southeast Asia has shockingly high rates. So as much as we like to um, tease ourselves in the U.S. and other countries might as well. Um, we actually are not the worst. Uh, my my postdoctoral uh, work was with a university in Singapore in Southeast Asia for this very reason that the metabolic problems there are just running rampant. So the problem is so prevalent, which is is so much of my motivation as a guy who studies insulin resistance. I see it everywhere, <clears throat> and yet others don't. And so, you know, it, it sort of behooves, it, it's, it's my burden now to make sure other people can see the problem the way I see it. I see what you mean. Yeah. Wow. That's, um, that's a huge percentage. That's insane. How about Australia? Do you know how many uh, people have that here or? Yeah, yeah. So in Australia, it's probably similar to Canada. Um, I, I would bet that it's similar levels. Um, uh, and that's likely, I would say, around 50 to 60% of adults um, are going to have it to some degree. Uh, now, the problem with insulin resistance is that it is not on people's radar. Now, of course, my professional goal is to change that. But there is a there's a, a kind of scenario that I can briefly describe that really highlights the problem. There are two metrics to be mindful of when it comes to insulin resistance. One is blood glucose levels and the other is insulin itself. Unfortunately, conventional medicine, whether it's, whether it's Australia or the US or anywhere else is almost totally focused on glucose. They look at metabolic problems in a glucose-centric paradigm or through the lens of glucose. So every year the person's coming in for their annual checkup and, and the, the nurse or the physician, the, the clinic is only looking at the glucose with never paying any attention to the insulin. And so over the years, they notice that the person is, oh, they're gaining a little weight. Maybe they have infertility. Maybe they have high blood pressure but they see that the glucose levels aren't changing. And so they don't think about the potential for some metabolic problem. But unfortunately, <clears throat> by focusing so heavily on the glucose, we're not seeing what's happening behind the scenes with insulin. Because while glucose is staying normal, insulin has been climbing every year to the point that it, it could be it could be three or four times or five times higher than it used to. But because we don't have an insulin centric paradigm, we ignore it. We overlook it completely. And then it's only when the body becomes so resistant to its own insulin that the insulin is really high, but now it's just not working well. And then finally, 10 or 20 years later, the glucose starts to climb and then they detect it clinically. But again, the tragedy is by looking only at glucose, we failed to detect the problem as early as we could. And then to make matters worse, because we still continue to look at these things as glucose problems, when the glucose starts to climb, the physician or the, the clinician may try to push the insulin up even higher by giving the, insul the person insulin therapy or drugs that will push insulin higher. And it will lower the glucose, but it makes them fatter and sicker. And the more aggressively we try to lower glucose by pushing up insulin, the patient becomes, they have uh, their risk of dying from heart disease triples. They're three times more likely to die from heart disease. And they're twice as likely to die from cancer and twice as likely to get Alzheimer's disease. Even though we may put their glucose levels to normal, it's because these aren't glucose problems. And the same goes for hypertension or 
uh, or, or infertility. These aren't glucose problems, they're insulin problems. And so as bad as the problem is, and I'm, you know, my guess being around 50 to 60% of the adults, it's, a, it's an informed guess. But unfortunately, we don't know because so many people are undiagnosed. They've been diagnosed with infertility and hypertension, perhaps, or early stage Alzheimer's disease. But in reality, they've been insulin resistant for 10 years. Wow, I am absolutely flabbergasted. This is this good. Is, this is, this good. is wild. Okay. Wow. All right. Um, how do you know if you have insulin resistance? Like, what are some telltale signs? How do you get uh, checked? Because I didn't know I had it up until six months ago, and I mm-hmm. literally self-diagnosed, and then I got it confirmed by my gynecologist. Interesting. Yep. But yeah. Yep. Yep. Good for you. Uh, and I, I do mean that good for you because this is the kind of this is the kind of thing like the reason I do podcasts and I'm interested in media is because I, I don't I can't hope that this message is going to get out through the conventional clinical channels. It, it has to be it has to be that a patient hears it and then the patient goes to the health provider and then the only hope then is that the health provider is open minded enough to listen to the patient and take it seriously. So how might someone know someone who who gets on to our conversation, however it comes to be. Um, There are some obvious signs. One would be um, high blood pressure. If someone has high blood pressure, it's almost a, a certainty that they have insulin resistance. So that's an obvious, that's an easy one and a very strong one. Second is the infertility that we've already been talking about, whether it's PCOS or, or um, uh, uh, erectile dysfunction. Either of those is going to be a strong indicator of insulin resistance. And then um, there are some skin manifestations, but this oh. doesn't always appear in people. Um, and there are two skin um disorders, I guess, for lack of a better word, that can be signs of insulin resistance. One is called acanthosis nigricans. And in fact, some young women with PCOS will have this. Uh, the gr- a girl, a PhD student I had in my lab had this. And acanthosis nigricans is more obvious, of course, on a paler complexion. Um, the lighter the skin, the fairer the complexion, the more the easier it is to see these. And so these are basically like, you know, I'm covered in freckles and it's a kind of like a big a big mark, but it it looks a little bit like a freckle where a person will have some patches of darker skin around the body. It can be on the face, it could be on the trunk, but Mm -hmm. it's just little sections of darker skin. And again, it's easier to see on a lighter complexion, but that's called- How big? Yeah, it can be varying size. Like this big or? Mm -hmm. Varying, Varying size, yeah. So one is those darker patches of skin. And then the second one, um, is uh, something called skin tags. And this is, oh. I bet you've seen these before, oh, but where, where people will have like a skin fold, like if they have a bit of a chubbier neck and they have a skin fold around their neck, they will very, very often have them around their neck. Um, they can have them around their armpits. Um, basically, wherever skin can rub, they will start to get these little, it's not like a bump of skin. It looks like a teeny little column, like a little pillar of skin sticking up. And they're, they're very, very small. Um, but it's just going to be some little projection of skin, almost like a little mushroom or a little column of skin. And often anywhere there's a skin fold around the belly, around the neck, around the armpits, um, but those, the skin tags. So they're again, very, very um, strong evidence of someone having insulin resistance. Okay. I'm going to challenge you there. I don't have um, any of those symptoms Mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't have any of those. So how? Well, I- you do, you do. Um, you have PCOS. And, yeah, and but- so again, I'm not saying okay. everyone has the skin disorders. So, mm. so yeah, I don't mean to imply that if you have insulin resistance, you absolutely mm. have these. No, not at all. Oh, okay. Um, this is kind of like me listing a quiz. Like okay. if someone were thinking, do I have insulin resistance? How would I know? Yep. It really, it would be kind of like how I outlined, like, do you have hypertension? Yep. Do you have a family member with type 2 diabetes? Do you have infertility, erectile dysfunction, or PCOS? And then one of them would be, do you have these skin disorders? Okay. You don't have to have all of them. Okay. And how do you get uh, tested for insulin resistance? Yeah. Yeah. That was the other part the of your process. question. Right. Right. Um, the best way is to actually get insulin measured. <clears throat> so if someone can get insulin measured, that's the best way. Um, so there's two ways to do this. One is just a fasting blood test. 
um, where someone gets their, their blood insulin measured just when they go to the clinic. And that isn't the best way to do it. Um, I'll mention the best way in just a moment, but it's one of the easier ways. So one, get your insulin measured, beg, plead, cajole, do whatever you can to your clinician and say, can you please measure my insulin at the very least a fasting insulin. And in, in Australia, um, insulin would be measured in picomoles, which is a different unit than the US. And I think it would be, you'd want it to be around 30 picomoles or less. That would be a very, very good sign. Now there's another blood test that can be used, and, and that is the triglyceride to HDL ratio. It's a surrogate marker, but it tends to be pretty accurate. So someone takes their triglycerides and divides it by their HDL cholesterol. But the spina, I'm going to be wrong here because once again, Australia is going to use millimolar, and in the US we use milligrams per deciliter. It's so okay, I don't actually, worry. I don't know what the I don't know what the units That's would be. Fine. The triglyceride to HDL ratio can mm. also be a good way. And then finally, the best gold standard is someone goes to the clinic and they have um, repeated blood tests. And so they drink a solution of glucose. Um, like when a, when a woman is pregnant, she'll go do something called an oral glucose tolerance test. She'll drink a little load of, of glucose and then they'll measure. I did that blood. one. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So if someone can convince their clinician to pull their blood and then measure insulin at these time points, and then if you see the insulin curve in drinking that glucose, you just want the peak of the insulin to happen at 30 minutes. If you measure at zero minutes, 30 minutes, you know, 60 minutes, 90 minutes, and so on, if it goes up and peaks at 30 minutes and then comes down, that's a good sign. If the peak is anywhere but 30 minutes, if it's kind of coming up at 30 minutes, but it gets higher at one hour or higher at 90 minutes, that's a bad sign. And it's a very strong indicator that the person has insulin resistance. I feel, Australia, this is not well, an Australian just, problem. It's, it's just everywhere, right? Everywhere. It's everywhere because yep. I got that test done three times and I begged her to do it. And she goes, you're all normal. No, you're fine. And I'm like, but it's gone up and down and up and down. Like, how am I normal? And only six years after that was I like, no, I have this a hundred percent. And good for you. I just feel like uh, GPs and physicians do not know how to properly diagnose insulin resistance. You know it's what? Just no, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. But in defense of Australia, mm. I I think that there are probably some of the most progressive, forward thinking with regards to metabolism, physicians mm. in Australia than maybe any other country. And I could really? mention, oh yeah, there are some wonderful, um, very, very mindful um, physicians. I don't remember which cities they're in, but I know them and have email exchanges with them from time to time. But there's a wonderful group of very oh, progressive. I, I, I think so. I think I, some in Sydney. Yeah. All right. I'm going to have to look into that. All right. Um, moving on. Um, what are your thoughts on the carnival diet? <laughs> Yeah, <clears throat> I am. I think the results on a carnivore diet are absolutely mind blowing. Uh, the number of people I have seen now, this is anecdotal because there is no study, there are no published studies on this. So, as a scientist, I like to just speak to the data um, mm -hmm. where I can cite studies um, from, from my mind. But in the case of the carnivore diet, there aren't studies published. So, I have to rely on anecdotes. But I've seen these, and the results are mind blowing. Um, it really is shocking the number of people that I've seen reverse their diabetes, improve their Alzheimer's disease, improve their skin, improve their fertility is, is mind blowing. And this is men and women. So my thoughts on the carnivore diet are, you cannot argue with the results. Um, I know some people get very upset about it because they have moral or ethical or maybe even scientific in their mind concerns with the carnivore diet. I have none of those. Um, I think um, maybe I can say it best this way. So I have two problems with the modern diet. Um, one, well, two problems because of with the modern diet. We've been told to eat most of our calories from carbohydrates. And uh, that is to me crazy for two reasons. One, carbohydrates spike insulin the most of all the macronutrients. Carbohydrates have a significantly higher insulin release compared to protein and fat. Uh, so that is interesting to me because a lot of my um, 
ideas are based on the, the foundation that an, an optimal or smart diet should be one that helps keep insulin low most of the time. So if you cut out the carbs, you're removing the biggest offender when it comes to insulin. Also, part of the um, ludicrousness of um, di- basing a diet on carbohydrates is that you are telling people to get the bulk of their calories from the one macronutrient that is not essential to humans. Humans have no biological need for dietary carbohydrates. That is, that's beyond debate. Even the most dogmatic dietitian who is steeped in the religion of dietetics has to admit carbohydrates are not essential to humans. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't eat them, but why build your diet? Why, why base your diet on the one macronutrient that you actually don't need? There are such things as essential amino acids. Thankfully, all animal proteins have them. There are such things as essential fats. Well, thankfully, all animal fats have those essential fats. There is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. Now, again, I'm not saying that none of us should eat them, but I am saying that should change the way we look at our plate and what we're putting on it. Why have the non-essential part of it be the biggest part of our plate. The biggest part of the plate should be, I think, committed to the macronutrients that we need and just happen to have the lowest effect on insulin. Wow. Okay. So based on that observation, I don't believe you agree that the vegan diet is a good diet. Um, yeah, so that, I know this is a very sensitive, it's a very sensitive topic because mm-hmm. people who adhere to vegan diets are incredibly zealous in their adherence. Um, no, no, a- as a scientist, I am worried that the further a person gets from eating animal products, the more nutrient deficient they become. Mm-hmm. Um, now, some examples, you cannot get vitamin B12 from, an, uh, from, from, veg, from plants. And so a person will start to develop pernicious anemia and, and a baby won't develop well. So there are concerns to the adult um, or, and the developing individual, including the developing fetus. So even in utero, if a baby lacks vitamin B12, there will be substantial birth defects. So you cannot get vitamin B12 from plants. So that's one nutrient that a person will be deficient in. You can't get sufficient iron. Um, it's almost impossible to get adequate iron from plants only. Um, and then essential fats like omega-3 fats, DHA and EPA, you cannot get them from plants. Um, it doesn't exist in plant form. And, and, then, and then the full complement of, I would say, amino acids, you can sort of try to cook those together with certain plants, or you just eat a little bit of meat. So um, I think a vegan diet is a privilege of the elite, where a person must be educated enough to know what they're deficient in, and then wealthy enough to afford the supplements to make up for it. So uh, I I think trying to promote a vegan diet on a global population, I think is absolutely ridiculous. And it would doom entire populations to to early death and poor health. Wow. Okay. How's that? Is that diplomatic? <laughs> no, that's really good. Um look, um I went vegan um for two weeks. I have never felt so weak in my life. I was like this like come over, come over. Yeah. yeah. And um I gave up after that. Um I don't know. I I just don't feel like it's the right diet for for me. But um in fact, uh, Despina, I think you're being a little polite um, because, uh, and, and there's something to be said for being polite, but the fact is it's not the right diet for humans. Uh, mm. I, I think it's safe to say um, we are not herbivores. Um, it is literally, if a person only ate fruits and vegetables and didn't supplement, they, they truly will die. Uh, there's, it, it is, that is a diet that is incompatible with human life. They will develop iron deficiency anemia and pernicious anemia. They won't be able to get pregnant. And so it's the end of their, their, their ancestral line. Um, uh, it's, it is not, um, I, I really do believe it is not a diet that is compatible with human survival. Yeah, I think I tend to agree with you. And I'm probably going to get, I don't know, flack, but I don't care. Well, and you can decide how much of this conversation to relate. You know, I don't know. I don't care. I just want everyone to be educated on the truth. There's not enough truth being told. 
Um, there was no, no. Let me let me have one last comment on that. Yeah, sure, go. Because go ahead. E even still, uh, uh, a person who is adhering to a vegan diet may say, "Well, I don't care if it's hurting me. Um, it's better for the planet, or, or it 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 helps alleviate some suffering to some degree." That both of those claims are very debatable, but. If a person is doing this for moral reasons or ethical reasons, well, that's hard to argue with, and I won't try to. And so that's where I kind of stand, I, I, I encourage someone to just stand their mm. ground that biochemically, physiologically, I have problems with that and then could, could show these problems. But if someone stakes, maybe makes the claim that, well, it's just better, or I feel better doing it morally or ethically, well, I can't argue with that. And I would say yeah. that's fine. And so I wanna give the person some credit mm. that while it's not going to be the health boon that they expect, although it may temporarily be, um, maybe there are other reasons for them doing it. I see.